that for us. A voluminous 886 pages. It is only through the use of this book that psychiatrists can diagnose, drug, and bill for services. In fact, the psychiatric industry currently uses the DSM to collect over $72 billion in private and government insurance money. The DSM is used to diagnose and then give a label, and the label is used for billing purposes. That's how they get paid. You have to have a term in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual in order to then call it a disease and treat it as a disease and write a prescription for it. And so because they can vote it in, they can create and then the drug industry can just take over and market their drugs for those new disorders. And those drugs were welcomed by psychiatry leaders because it made us real doctors. Of course, first the public had to believe that there was something wrong with them and that that thing wrong was biochemical and that that could then be treated by a drug which was supposed to cure all. And so it was relatively easy, I think, to say, well, look, let's start looking at mental illness as fundamentally um, a matter of chemical imbalance in the brain. Chemical imbalance is a term that's used as a marketing ploy as opposed to anything that there's scientific evidence to support. Nobody has yet measured, demonstrated, or created a test to show that somebody has a chemical imbalance in their brain, period. How do you market a drug that restores the chemical balance or corrects a chemical imbalance? How can you do that in good conscience if you don't even know what one is? The whole myth of the chemical imbalance was created to sell drugs. And while psychiatrists and drug companies have used this myth to make billions moving vast quantities of psychotropic drugs into the bodies of unsuspecting consumers, the public has paid the ultimate price. An estimated half of all Americans who commit suicide are on psychotropic drugs. Annually, psychotropic drugs are estimated to kill more than two and a half times more people than are killed by homicide. And who is entrusted with protecting the public against these dangerous psychotropic drugs? In the United States, it is the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, whose psychiatric drug advisory panels are dominated by psychiatrists who shuttle between the drug industry, academia, private practice, and government, the so-called revolving door. The revolving door at FDA is one of the primary reasons why the system that we have works so poorly. That revolving door is a direct result of the fact that a group of people with the same mindset are put into positions of being regulators and in the position of being formulators and sellers and marketers. The panels that are formed by the FDA to evaluate these drugs, the psychiatrists who are on those panels, almost all of them have conflicts of interest where they have directly or indirectly received funding from the very industry and the very parties within the industry whose drugs they are evaluating. So there's this, this tight little relationship between psychiatry, pharmaceutical industry, and FDA where they each mutually support each other, and yet the mental health of the population does not improve. Take, for example, the FDA drug evaluation panel that approved the antidepressant Paxil. Every psychiatrist on that panel has financial ties to the pharmaceutical industry. And these conflicts of interest have been rampant enough to prompt congressional investigation. When I check these advisory committees who make recommendations to the FDA, and they're always approved, always approved after the advisory committee, I found that there were conflicts of interest I found that many of the people on the advisory committees had never filed a proper report on stocks and bonds that they owned that, that might uh, be viewed as a conflict of interest, and they're by law supposed to do that. And this network of financial conflict of interest between psychiatry, the drug industry, and the FDA became even more entrenched in 1992 after passage of the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, also known as PDUFA. Through this bill, the FDA would be paid a fee of $100,000 per drug 
to ensure that psychotropic medications would be rushed through the approval process and into the hands of prescribers faster than ever. Congress told the FDA, your job is no longer to make sure drugs are squeaky clean safe before they get out on the market. Your job now is to hurry up and get new drugs on the market faster. It acted to set the priorities of the FDA so that if there was a fee paid for a particular drug approval, it could be put on the fast track and rushed to market with less than the usual scrutiny that the FDA would give it. And this fast track has traded safety for sales. Since the passage of PDUFA, time spent on drug evaluation plunged from almost two years in 1992 to only six months four years later. Meanwhile, the number of new drugs released to the public doubled. Though fast tracking is disastrous for public safety, it reaps huge profits for psychiatry and the drug industry. Because the sooner a drug is approved, the sooner it makes money. And the money is big. Every day, the average psychotropic drug grosses over $7.7 .7 million. One drug, Zyprexa, rakes in almost $12 million daily. And even though FDA now charges over $1 million per new drug application, the pharmaceutical fast track shows no signs of slowing. If you look at the relationship between the FDA, the pharmaceutical industry, and the psychiatrist, there's some kind of game that they're playing there. And what is the game? Well, you could say it's money, definitely money. And when you follow the money, you realize that there is no money in health. There's big money in disease. That's why all you hear about is managing disease or treating disease. You don't really talk about curing disease. And so psychiatrists have become mainstream doctors in America. And that is because of the pharmaceutical industry. They can thank the pharmaceutical industry because they become mainstream and because they have a lot more money than they used to. And the drug industry can thank them because now they have thousands of soldiers in their army distributing these drugs to everybody. From the smallest infant to the oldest senior citizen, no one is immune from any of the hundreds of fictitious disorders invented by psychiatrists that fuel a multi-billion dollar psychotropic drug industry. And every day, psychiatrists are casting their nets ever wider. And all it takes? Another psychiatric label. How many people do you know who have been diagnosed with a mental disorder? One. With a mental disorder? Um, two. I'm sure a couple. I know a few. About three or four personally. Probably four. Half a dozen? I'll say about nine. At least a dozen. I'll bet I could count 15. 20 that I personally know. My uh, oldest son is diagnosed. And my mother was diagnosed. A kid from uh, my childhood. A friend of next one. Just my grandfather and cousins. A friend of mine, friends. My sister, my neighbors. Two friends, a girlfriend. A nation, one friend. My mother. All my friends, everybody I know. An apparent flood of mental illness is all around us. Where is this coming from? Psychiatrists, whose diagnostic and statistical manual can label anyone walking the earth today as mentally ill. Psychiatrists, I believe, they look at every human being and they divide humans into two classes, clients and potential clients. We see this no more uh, prevalent in any field than in the field of the mental disorders, where one disease after another is invented and then popularized and the public is made to worry about it. It's a disease mongering. It's the selling of sickness, you know, sometimes it's a, it's a drug in search of a market and it's giving public awareness to minor conditions with the ultimate goal is to sell more medications. It's not caring for people. When you run out of symptoms, you don't have any more clientele to market to. So you have to invent disease. And with psychiatric medications, you can invent diseases all day long. Look at human variation. Everyday things like shyness, um, sadness, or even a situational depressions um, like grieving, postpartum depression, 
they all become studied 